Good morning. I'm so excited to be here because I'm so excited to tell you what God did in Israel. And um, let me start by thanking God. I'm thankful that he called me to go, and I'm thankful for my Calvary family. You prayed. You prayed big time, and I know it. And the Lord answered your prayers. Um, I have a hard time sometimes composing or composing myself. I'm a puddle of tears when I think about the war, and um, I was concerned about ministering to people in a puddle of tears. And the spirit went before me and filled me, and um, I had composure, so most of the time. So <laughs> I was thankful for that. Um, he also gave me more energy than I normally had, so I was able to do all the things. I know, seriously. Um, you not only prayed, but you gave. You gave beyond my wildest dreams, and isn't that like our loving Lord? He gives beyond what we ask or think, and that's what he did, and he will use it for his glory. You prayed that I would be led by the Spirit and who to give the money to. I was very concerned about that because I want to be a good steward with what he has given me. And the entire trip, I gave without hesitation to anybody I gave to, and I knew that the Spirit was calling me to give to that person or to that organization. So um, he answered your prayers there. He used you to plant seeds for his kingdom that he will use for his glory. So we pray that, that it comes along and the seeds get watered and that there will be a plentiful harvest. I'm not going to have time to tell you everything, and it's very difficult because I would like to tell you everything, but I'm not going to have time. And so you're going to get a glimpse in, into my two weeks in Israel, um, and I'm not going to have time to tell you everywhere I donated your money to, but you will get an idea. Um, so put your seatbelts on because we're going to go fast. Um, so photo number one. I've never been to a country during a war. Um, I didn't know what to expect, but I knew that I was called to go, and I had no fear. I felt, did feel the heaviness of war when I was there, and I heard a lot of stories, but I was happy to see that the Jewish nation is um, choosing to move on the best they can. You know, the Jewish people are very resilient, and this is by God's design. At the airport, we were greeted, as you can see there, with many um, bring them home now signs with photos of the hostages. In fact, this was pretty prevalent all around Israel. They love their people, and they want them home, and they want them home now. Um, second photo, uh, Rakashe Lev is a nonprofit that operates out of Sheba Rehabilitation Center. Shemi is the CEO, and he hosted us one afternoon and told us what they do there at Sheba Re Rehab Center. Sheba is one of the top 10 hospitals in the world. So any hostage that is released or, cap or rescued, they're sent to Sheba. Wounded soldiers go to Sheba for help. Um, so we were then able to go into the courtyard to minister to these wounded soldiers um, that were able enough to get to the courtyard. And they had friends visiting them, and we gave them little goodie bags, which, by the way, some of your do donations paid for the items in the goodie bags. And we made up these bags to bless them with things that they may like to have in the hospital. Um, next photo. We visited a lar the largest Israeli civil aid organization called Brothers and Sisters for Israel. They're 100% run by volunteers. They're made up of many professionals, mostly professionals, who offer the expertise in medical, um, farming, evacuation. They provide food and accommodations for those who are displaced, among many, many, many other things. And Shani is the woman who um, was telling us all about the organization. She's a professional woman. She used to work for Netanyahu. She was his personal assistant. She's very well put together and very composed. And she was explaining to us everything that, that this organization does, composed the whole time, told us about October 7th when the terror attack happened, how she hightailed it over to the border to capture or to help um, people escape and bring them into safety, never one time thinking about her own safety. I mean, she's a woman and very composed, and I want you to meet her. My name is Janine Sifon. I was born and raised in Israel, studied economics and business. Um, was first, um, my first job was Prime Minister Netanyahu's personal assistant. I then moved to uh, New York to be the controller of the Israeli mission to the U.S., Ministry of Defense. Um, came back to Israel, did my journey in the VC world, in the high tech, had my own business, and since October 8th, I'm here at Brothers and Sisters for Israel. I'm a daughter of Iranian immigrants, first generation in Israel. And I'm proud of uh, being Jewish and being Zionist, and uh, I'm Sarah Hai. 
Am Israel high, the people of Israel live. That's how she ended her statement. So Shani's very composed, very much of a businesswoman, until, until somebody on our team said, Shani, I want to know how you are doing. And she repeated again, I want to know how you are doing. How are you coping with all of this? And Shani broke down and began to cry. And she told us how hard and how difficult it was. And so my team member said, can we pray for you? And she said, because you're a Jewish person, you need to ask him. And she said, yes. And so we prayed over Shani. And the soothing balm of the Lord's prayer came over her. Um, just being able to lift her up in prayer and to hold her up, it was a, a, a tender moment. And it really touched her, and she was a puddle of tears. Next photo. I made two home visits with Russian-speaking um, Jews. They're Holocaust survivors. Olga and Tanya translated for us. Philip, Manny, and Samuel shared their stories with us. Scripture was read. Scripture was presented to them on a little poster. And we presented them with goodie bags, including Enstrom's candy, which Enstrom's in town donated. Um, you'll see Samuel's kissing his Enstrom's candy because it's a kosher piece of candy, and he was so excited. Um, I asked uh, Manny and Samuel if I could pray for them. It touched my heart when Samuel said, just a minute, and I like looking to see what's happening. And um, they said he went to get his kippah, which is the little cap that um, many of the men in Israel wear. And what he was doing is he knew that I was, because I had asked to pray for him, I'm a Jewish, or I mean, I'm a Gentile woman in a Jewish home. And he knew that I would be approaching the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. That's amazing that he went to get his kippah to put on with the Gentile woman ministering to him. So that was a tender moment. The next photo. We went to the city of Stederot, um, and we met Michael and Dina Beener. And he's the pastor there in Stederot of a church. And Stederot is less than one mile from the Gaza border. And believe me, they got hit hard. Most of the locals have been displaced and are in hotels or apartments um, in safer locations. Um, some of them had just started to move back to Stetter Road when we were there ministering. Michael and Dina decided to wait until school's over because they don't want to uproot their kids again. They had to during the October 7th, and they uprooted them. They're in a different school, so now they don't want, they want to wait. So they're, they're ministering back and forth. But Stetter Road got hit really hard. In fact, if you look it up, it's called the Battle of Stetter Road. And you, do you see that lot with empty flags? That there stood a two, either it was a two or a three level police station. It was an area police station, a great big police station, and that's where the terrorists hit. They did their job from there mostly. Um, terrorists killed 50 people in town and also killed 20 police officers. There are 20, 50 civilians and 20 police officers. You know, I've done ministry a lot in Stetterot. And they are terrorized all the time, but never to this degree. So Michael and Dina, what they do is they offer the hope of Yeshua, the hope of Jesus, to those who are hurting. So with, um, with Michael and Dina, we delivered food vouchers around town to the people who were coming home. Because they're coming home to a house they haven't been in, and there's no groceries. And so we went to these homes. We were able to pray with these people, and we were able to give them vouchers and tell them this is from City of Life Ministries, the Messianic congregation here in town. And so your donation, you gave a sizable donation to this ministry. Next slide. We visited the First Baptist Church in Bethlehem. There we met um, Pastor Dr. Naeem Corey. I always have a hard time with his name, and his son Stephen who, are, who is a pastor at Calvary Church in Jerusalem and president of Holy Land Missions. They are the real deal. They're born-again Arabs. They're preaching the truth, including, and you need to listen, this is very rare, including the truth that the land belongs to the Jewish people because of the promise God made with Abraham in, in Genesis 15. They preach this. Now imagine being an Arab and preaching this. They want others to know Jesus, and they love Arabs, and they love Jews, and they share the gospel with anybody that'll listen. Bethlehem's a really tough place to be a follower of Jesus. I spoke with Stephen um, Corey on the telephone yesterday, and he was telling me that in Bethlehem, they're 85% Muslim and 15% are labeled Christian. 
He said that includes these so-called churches that are not Muslim. Any church that isn't a Muslim, they consider a Christian, but they only have a form of religion. And out of the 15%, only 1% of those are really born-again Christians. So you've heard Bethlehem's a, Christ, a Christian area. It's not. Don't, don't listen to that. Stephen's ministered in very dangerous areas, including in Judea and Samaria, like Ramallah and Janine, which none of us would probably ever step foot in. He's been written up in the voice of the martyrs, and Naim's brother has been killed for his faith. A fire was started outside of their church. They are persecuted, definitely persecuted, but they're doing amazing things. God is using them in the land, and the Spirit is alive in them and working for the kingdom. And you made a sizable donation to this organization. The next slide, please. I made a home visit with a family that I have an ongoing relationship with. Esther's a widow. Her son is dead. Her daughter Shirley's blind, and Orna is bedridden and unable to talk. She has progressive MS. We held hands at her bedside and spoke words of encouragement to her. We communicated the best we could through a, a friend that I have in town named Zephora, and Zephora knows a little English. <laughs> this family is Orthodox. They're Orthodox Jews. I'm a Christian in the house, and they know that I'm a follower of Yeshua, and they call me a righteous Gentile. But you need to know, as you already do, they don't see me. They see Jesus. They see something very different. They see Jesus, and they're drawn to it. So pray for the Spirit to remove their blinders, that they would see Yeshua as their Messiah, and you gave a sizable donation to this very needy family. Um, and I told them that the money came from you. So um, the next slide, please. In a hotel, I met a lady that was from the States. She wondered what we were going to be doing. The next few days, I told her we'd be going to visit the IDF up on the Lebanon border. And she says, I've got something for you. They had these printed, and they weren't able to give them all out. So she presented us with these bandanas that have Hebrew scripture written in them in black. It's hard probably from where you're able to see. But it's the Hebrew scriptures for the entire Psalm of 91. And you guys, you got to go home and read Psalm 91. It's like perfect to give to an IDF soldier serving in Gaza. Um, so next slide. So from there, the next day, we did. We hightailed it with Christian Friends of Israel, and we went up to the Lebanon border to the Golani Brigade. And we met at a uh, commander's base. And the lieutenant commander was our had spoke to us, and he has a brand new baby. And we said to him, are you, are you not missing your baby? And you have this little child, and you've been here forever. And he said, what am I to do? Where would I go? Where would we go? Where would my children go? This is our home. This is all we have. So I do what I must for my children. And this is their attitude. They work very hard. I struck up a conversation with a young man who informed me, and I gave him one of these. He had not been speaking to God. And he was in Gaza for two or three months. He began speaking to God. God is using this war to bring the lost sheep of Israel back to him. Then the last story I'd like to tell you, next slide, is um, she actually was the very first person I met in Israel, and her name is Mira. And Mira, um, I believe, is a divine appointment. The first night after arrival, I met Mira at the hotel. She's displaced and living in the hotel with her dog because of where she lives is very dangerous. Um, Mira told us that she is the, her daughter is a mitt, and a mitt was a hostage for 55 days. She told us how awful it has been for her daughter and how all she wants to do is sleep. Amit is an attorney and at this point is very unable to work. She's terrorized. Mira goes over and cooks for her. When Amit came home, she didn't have a home to go to. As you notice, they came and ripped her out of her home and then they, they destroyed her home. She too is displaced, staying somewhere else. Um, we stayed a few more nights in the hotel, and every time we would see Mira, we would visit, and she allowed us to pray over her. And the Lord put her smack dab in my path as I was getting ready to leave for the bus to head to Jerusalem. I took her aside, and I asked her amidst financial state. Mira was honest and said she gets a little bit of money from the government, um, but she has many needs. So I got in my purse, and as I opened my purse... She saw what I was doing, and she said, what, what? 
and I handed the cash to her from you, and I, she couldn't compose herself. And I said, Mira, this is from Christians who live in my area. They care about you, they pray for you, and they love you, and they love the Jewish people. And I said, but more importantly, this is from God. I said, he loves you, he sees your needs, he cares for you, and he wants you to talk to him. Call him, talk to him. I've been in touch with Mira just a couple days ago on WhatsApp and asked her how she was doing. She said she's fine, but Amit um, is not so fine. She said, but she will be fine. Um, I'm hoping to see her when we return. Isaiah 40, verse 1 says, comfort, yes, comfort my people. This is what took place in Israel. We comforted those who were broken and those who were helping the broken. We comforted those who are bringing the good news of the gospel to the brokenhearted. And I want to thank you for being part of that comfort. Next slide. Craig and I are headed to Israel, um, Lord willing, at the end of um, April. And, or April? May. <laughs> at the end of May. And um, we're going to be taking a team to work because there's much work to be done. As of yesterday, I have one spot left. So if anybody's interested, we're going to go for a month. Um, and who knows, you may pick fruit and you may watch the sunset on the Mediterranean. So thank you and thank you for praying. All right, that was awesome. Thanks, Jody. Um, yeah, there's about $10,000 that Jody was able to take over there and distribute so um, a blessing from us to them um yeah jody brought up psalm 91 that was on that um whatever you call it bandana so so after 9 11 so october 7th was israel's 9 11 after 9 11 the lord put that message on my heart from psalm 91 1 so 9-11, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in him I will trust. So keep them in prayer, a uh, very difficult time in Israel, but God is using this, as Jody shared, to bring many people back to him. So for years and years, 90% of Israel has been agnostic, only 10% are orthodox, and they're stubborn, but it's that 90% that really need to come back to know that Jesus is their Messiah. So let's pray. Father, as we come before you, we ask that you would give us ears to hear what your Spirit is saying to us from your Word. We pray, Lord, that you would minister to each one of us. Lord, even as you were ministering to your uh, people there in Israel, we pray that all these seeds that have been planted and watered, you would bring the increase, Lord. We pray that many of the Jewish people would come to know Jesus as Messiah. Lord, we know that you love uh, your people. And we know, Lord, a day is coming when every Jew that makes it through the Great Tribulation will see Jesus at his second coming. And every Jewish person will receive Jesus as their Messiah. Lord, in the meantime, we just pray you would continue to raise up many believers, uh, even in Israel. Uh, strengthen them, encourage them, Lord, to preach the gospel, proclaim the truth of uh, your word to those who need to hear that Jesus loves them. He died on the cross for their sins. He's the final sacrifice. Even as we've looked through the book of Exodus, Jesus fulfilled everything that we're looking at. And it's because of your uh, fulfilling all the law and the prophets that we can rest in your finished work. And so, Father, as we open up your word, give us ears to hear. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Turn to Exodus 31. Uh, as we come into chapter 31, Moses is at the end of his 40 days and 40 nights on Mount Sinai with the Lord. In chapter 32, he'll finally come down from Mount Sinai. But first, God has a couple more important things to tell Moses, and in a sense, Moses has been given all the blueprints for the tabernacle, all the uh, you know, garments that they'll make for Aaron and his sons, all the tapestry, the fencing around 
the tabernacle as well. I mean, there's so much that God has shown him. And uh, so he's got the blueprints for all these things. But a question on his mind, Moses' mind was probably something like, this is amazing, Lord, but there's no way I'm going to be able to make all these things. And that's true. He couldn't do it. And so as we move from um, the priestly duties, we're going to come into the practical ministry. We're going to go from more spiritual things to more practical things. And we're going to see that this is very, very important as well. In other words, Moses is not a one-man show. It's going to take a whole bunch of people working together to accomplish what God has given to Moses. And so this will be a good picture of the body of Christ working together, using our various gifts and talents, um, the, the things God has given us and what he's called us to do. So let's pick up in chapter 31. Let's look at verse 1. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom in understanding, in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship, to design artistic works, to work in gold and silver and bronze, in cutting jewels for setting, in carving wood, and to work in all manner of workmanship. And I indeed, I have appointed with him Aholiab, the son of Ahishamach of the tribe of Dan. And I have put wisdom in the hearts of all the gifted artisans, that they may make all that I have commanded you, the tabernacle of meeting, the ark of the testimony and the mercy seat that is on it, and all the furniture of the tabernacle, the table and its utensils, that's the table of showbread, the pure gold lampstand with all its utensils, the altar of incense, the altar of burnt offering with all of its utensils, and the laver and its base, the garments of ministry, the holy garments for Aaron the priest, and the garments of his sons to minister as priests, and the anointing oil, and sweet incense for the holy place, according to all that I have commanded you, they shall do. So here we're introduced to this guy named Bezalel, and his name means in the shadow of God, and he will be like the foreman. He will oversee all the building that's going to go on, and it's going to be hundreds of people involved in this. He will be overseeing this entire project. Uh, he will build many of these things as well, and um, again, all the furnishings that are mentioned here, the holy garments of Aaron and his sons, uh, he is literally the jack of all trades. I mean, Bezalel can do anything. He can make every, everything. He can fix anything that's broken. I mean, he's a, a designer, it says here. He's a jeweler. He's a carpenter. It says he's a metal worker, a stonemason. He is one gifted man. And can I just say what a blessing that is? To have so many gifted men and women in the church here that not only work, you know, in ministry here with the children and worship team and all those different things, but serving the Lord at home, serving the Lord where you work, serving the Lord wherever you are, that's part of the body of Christ. It's not just doing stuff here, but wherever you are, you are the body of Christ and God wants all of us to serve him together. Here in verse 3, we see the main reason Bezalel was able to accomplish all that God called him to do. It says that God put the Holy Spirit in him. That's so important. God filled him with the Holy Spirit. And we'll see the same anointing that the Holy Spirit would put upon Aaron and his sons to do the spiritual ministry. That same Holy Spirit is upon Bezalel and then all these different workers as they build all these things for the tabernacle. So that's true for Aholiab as well, his right-hand man. In fact, these two guys will recruit hundreds of men and women to work in all these different aspects of the tabernacle, from making the big furniture pieces to making all the, the garments, to making all the, you know, the coverings that go around the tabernacle, go over it. There's, what, four layers over the, temp the tabernacle. The fencing all around was very intricately made, all the gold rings. I mean, there's so many utensils, hundreds of utensils that would be used as they would trim the wicks on the lampstand, as they would, you know, turn the meat over on the altar of sacrifice, as they cleaned out the ashes. I mean, so many other things in what we've looked at. And so everybody was necessary. 
And so this anointing oil we looked at last week, uh, the incense, these things had to be meticulously made and measured out. So all these people needed to be filled with the Holy Spirit in order to do their practical work of ministry. Again, from God's perspective, there is no difference between the secular and the sacred. A lot of people like to say, oh, you're a pastor, so that's sacred. Oh, you're a, you know, a, a worker out in the field. That's not sacred, that's secular. No, everything we do is sacred unto the Lord. He doesn't make a distinction. And that's what we see very clearly in this section as well. God wants all of us walking in the power and with the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So that means as Christians, whether you're a carpenter or an electrician or a mechanic or a business person, a stay-at-home mom or dad, whatever it is, you're retired you are just as spiritual, just as important as anybody that's in full-time ministry. Oftentimes, the Holy Spirit's giftings in our lives, it's a combination of natural-born talents that God has given us, and then He will, once we're saved, start putting other things into our lives so that we can live uh, and do what God's called us to do. But both of those are from God, and we see this throughout the Bible. David was a shepherd boy watching over his father's flock, and then God raised him up to be the shepherd over the nation of Israel. We see with the, the apostles, the early disciples, most of them are fishermen, and then yet Jesus turned them into fishers of men. We see the same thing with Nehemiah. Nehemiah was simple cupbearer before the king, uh, Artaxerxes uh, of the Persian Empire, and so he was used by the Lord to build the walls around Jerusalem, to get Jerusalem fixed up after their captivity. Colossians 3.17, it says, And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Again, whatever you do, it's unto the Lord. Again, whether it's a spiritual ministry or a secular job, it's all for God's glory. So, what kind of things do you like to do? What motivates you? Well, whatever those are, you need to take it to the Lord. You need to pray and ask the Lord, how can this be used for your glory? And then whatever He shows you, you have to surrender it back to the Lord. It's so important because we're not our own anymore. We were bought at a price. And we have to surrender it to the Lord so that He can then fill us with His Spirit and use us for His glory. That's so important to surrender back to God so that now when you use your gifts and talents, it's not to bring glory and honor to you, but it's to bring glory and honor to the Lord. And a lot of times that's the only difference between gifted people. One takes the glory for themselves. Look what I've done. I'm so amazing in my job. And then the other gives the glory to the Lord, to our Savior. As you know, apart from Jesus, we can do nothing that has any eternal value, but we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Now, there are a lot of things that we can do in life where we often take the Holy Spirit for granted. Again, a lot of people just look at their jobs as a way to make money so they can buy, you know, pay the bills, buy groceries, just buy food. But that's just a part of why you are working at the job you are currently working at or why you're retired or why you're whatever it might be. It's so that God can use you wherever you are for His glory. Jesus says it like this, Matthew 5, 16. This doesn't matter where you are in life. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. In other words, whatever you're doing, wherever you are working, we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit so that others can see more of Jesus and less of you, less of me. We want Jesus to stand out, not ourselves. That became very real to me once I got saved. You know, I was just working, doing things just to try to make some money so I could get enough gas money to go surfing and those type of things. But then once you get saved, whether it was working at a, a boat dock, which was also a rental shop at De Anza Camp Land Marina on Mission Bay in San Diego, or for eight years driving bobtail trucks around San Diego County with newspapers, or when we moved here, being a custodian for three and a half years at Pomona Elementary School, or then three and a half years in uh, the warehouse here in the school district, whatever I was doing, 
I gave it to the Lord. And I thanked the Lord for whatever job he gave me. And God would use those things. I looked for opportunities to be light and salt wherever I was. Uh, I mentioned at first service, Jimmy Perea was here. So Jimmy, I met him at the warehouse. And Ron Adina was part of that as well. And we worked together. And during our lunch break, I started doing a Bible study. We, you know, we had a big warehouse full of all these pallets stacked up with you know, canned goods and all these different things you deliver to the schools, papers and so forth. And I would just sit on the pallet and start doing a Bible study. And guys started showing up. Some of the other guys are listening, you know, what's this guy talking about? I got written up by our supervisor, went all the way up to the head of the school district. And I wish I kept that letter because he was basically saying, well, I guess we can't stop you since you're not getting paid for lunch. And that's what I told him right off the bat. It's like, you're not paying me for lunch, so don't tell me what I can do on my lunch break. And they said, well, as long as you're not proselytizing. And it's like, whatever. So, you know, we, we just kept going, and it was great. And those guys are part of the church to this day. I mean, all of us are in a spiritual battle, no matter where we are, no matter what we're doing. And so you never want to put your faith in neutral. You never want to uh, take off the full armor of God, because we know, as Peter says, 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And then Peter goes on to say, Re resist him steadfast in the faith. Now, another extremely important place that we can take the Holy Spirit for granted is in our marriages. We need to recognize that our marriages are a gift from God, and He doesn't just want us going through the motions of being married. But we need the Holy Spirit's power to flow in our lives and through our lives in order to love our spouse with the love of Jesus. You can't fake it. You have to go to the Lord. You have to receive what He has for you so that you can live out what He's called you to do. This is the essence of Ephesians 5.17. It says, Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. What's the will of the Lord? Well, here it is. And do not be drunk with wine, which is wastefulness or dissipation, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And some of the evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit is this, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. In other words, you've got joy in your life because the Holy Spirit's upon your life. And then he says, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. So that's first and foremost, husbands and wives submitting to one another. Then he says, wives, and this is why you need the Holy Spirit, ladies, submit to your own husband as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Uh, I encourage you to read uh, Colossians 3, 16, and 17 along with this, because he goes on to say, you know, uh, submit to your own wives as unto the Lord. And so whatever the Lord has called you to do and be, that's how you need to be with your spouse as well. So if your husband is a jerk and says, I want you to do this, you can say, no, the Bible says don't do that. So I'm not going to obey you. I'm going to obey God rather than you. So it doesn't mean you, you submit in everything. Your husband can be a real jerk. So you don't submit to him in that. So he says, therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. And then for us husbands, love your wives, that's agape love, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. So before you husbands say, wife, you better submit to me, you better look in the mirror and say, am I loving my wife the same as Jesus loves me? Again, you can't do that apart from the Holy Spirit. Because how does Jesus love us? Perfectly, sacrificially, unconditionally. And so we need that same love working in us and through us. That's why we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Then Paul goes on to talk about the relationships between parents and children, employers, employees. The point is all of those things are spiritual and supernatural roles that God gives us. Now I bring this all up to say this. Most of the time when we talk about supernatural gifts, we talk about gifts of miracles, gifts of healing, speaking in tongues, and so forth. We believe all the gifts are valid for today, but what is more important than any gift of the Spirit is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. That takes precedence over any gift of the Spirit. Uh, Jesus tells us this 
God's agape love, John 13, 34. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I, there it is again, exactly as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. I don't do that all the time. You know, I love you, but I don't like everybody. There's times I don't like people. He's like, ah, I don't want to see them. That's not how we're to be. We need the Lord's love working in us and through us. Now, I'm not talking about any of you in here. <laughs> Just want to be clear on that. Then there's the Apostle Paul, because after he talks about all the gifts and manifestations of the Holy Spirit, you know, speaking in tongues, interpretation, you know, having words of wisdom, words of knowledge, and all those things, he says, I show you a more excellent way in other words, this takes supreme superiority over the gifts is love. So he says this, 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 12 is all about the gifts and manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Then 1 Corinthians 13, 1 says, Do I speak with the tongue of men and of angels, but have not love? I become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. In other words, it's like me getting on the drum set here and making a bunch of weird noise. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and, and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, so I'm going to sacrifice my life, but have not love, it profits me nothing. And, and so again, we all need to be filled. We all need to be refilled with the Holy Spirit every day of our lives so that we can be the vessels of honor for God's glory and not for ourselves. Here's another verse that removes that line between the secular and the sacred in God's eyes. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? Aaron was singing about that earlier. For you were bought at a price. I surrender all, except for this, Lord. I surrender all. Well, maybe not that either. No, that's not what it says. You're not your own, for you were bought at a price. What was the price? The blood of Jesus that he shed on the cross for all of our sins. He bought you. That's what it means to be redeemed. You're not your own. You can't say, well, I'm going to live my life this way, Lord, and I'll just, you know, walk with you on Sundays, or I'll just hang out with you certain times. And the rest of it, it's all me. It's all what I want to do. You're not surrendered to the Lord. You weren't bought with a price then, for the price was the blood of Jesus. He says, therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Or in other words, you belong to God. Your body? So you can't say, I'm going to live, you know, and drink and get loaded, and I'm going to party, but spiritually I'm going to walk with Jesus. Ah, you, he bought you, body, soul, and spirit. You, you belong to Him. And that simply means whatever your job is, or whatever your role is, you should be able to say, I am a God-ordained mechanic, I'm a God-ordained you know, doctor, I'm a God-ordained nurse, I'm a God-ordained teacher, I'm a God-ordained police officer, plumber, fill in the blank. I'm a God-ordained husband and wife, mom, dad, whatever you are, you should be able to say, I am a God-ordained this because that's the role God has placed me in. There's a great example of this in Acts chapter 9. If you remember the story about the lady who had the weird name Dorcas, I wouldn't recommend if any of you are going to have kids, you know, I'd stay away from Dorcas, she'll get picked on. You dork, I mean, come on. It was actually a nice name because back then it meant gazelle. And so she was a, a wonderful woman. And it says this in Acts 9.36. At Joppa, there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas, again, gazelle. This woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. And it goes on to tell us her ministry was to make clothing and tunics for poor people, for widows and orphans. That was her primary job, her role in the body of Christ, making clothes for those in need. Well, she died, and the people were so upset by this. They were so sad. I mean, she was a blessing to so many people that they send to uh, 
Peter, and Peter comes to her house. She's dead there, and God uses Peter to raise her from the dead. And she goes on to make more clothes for the poor and the widows and so forth. And in contrast, when Peter died, he stayed dead. God didn't need him. He doesn't need me. Nobody's irreplaceable. You know, we're just moving in and out whatever God has for us. But she was so integral to the beginning of the, the ministry, he raises her from the dead. Again, the point is, the practical ministry is just as important as the so-called priestly ministry. After all, we all need to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to do what God calls us to do. Another thing we see here with these verses in Exodus 31 is that when God calls somebody to ministry, he will also enable them to do what he's called them to do. Pastor Chuck used to say, when God guides, God provides. In other words, whenever God calls somebody to do something for the kingdom of God, he will always give you the ability, the resources, whatever you need to do what he's called you to do. He doesn't say, okay, Jeff, do this, and then he bails on you. No, he's going to equip you, he's going to use you, he's going to give you the resources you need to do what he calls you to do. Notice in verse 2, God says, I have called. In verse 3, I have filled him with the Spirit of God. Verse 3 again, I have given him wisdom and understanding and knowledge. Verse 6, I have appointed him with a holy ab. And verse 6, I have put wisdom in the hearts of all these gifted artisans. And so again, when God calls us to do something, you can be assured that he will also enable you and equip you to do what he's, he's not going to bail on you. He's not going to just like, okay, you're on your own. If I'm on my own, I'm toast. And so he will also appoint the place where he wants you to go. Maybe Israel. Maybe India, whatever it is. Maybe to your next door neighbor. Maybe to your long lost relative. People will often ask, well, what does God want me to do? The answer might be as simple as what really motivates you? Where's your passion? What kind of things do you, are you drawn to? What excites you? That could be the call of God upon your life as he draws you. He places a burden upon your life and he puts that burden in your heart. Remember when we first started looking at God's calling on Moses' life? He was reluctant. He didn't want to do what God called him to do. God told him everything that God was going to do as he was going to be used to be the deliverer over Israel. And Bo Moses came up with one excuse after another. He says, who am I, Lord? You know, the people won't listen to me. Pharaoh won't listen to me. He, he literally says, I don't talk too good. I'm slow of speech. He had all these excuses. And finally, the Lord said, what's in your hand? Well, I got this rod, this staff. I use it when I'm watching over my father-in-law's sheep. He says, okay, we're going to use that. We're just going to use that staff. Now you're going to be a shepherd over my flock, the Israelites. Gideon is another great example of this. When God called Gideon, he was discouraged. He was depressed. He was defeated. The Midianites were ruling over the Israelites, and they really trampled them down, trampled them down. I don't know if he, is trampled even a word? Well, this allergy medication makes your brain do weird things, so trampled, that'll work. But then, you know, Jesus appears to him in the Old Testament, and he says to Gideon, O oh, mighty man of valor, and Gideon's like, yeah, right, Mighty man of valor, I'm hiding from the Midianites. He was, you know, winnowing his grain, hiding in this place where nobody could see him because he was terrified of the Midianites. And, he, and the Lord says, oh, mighty man of valor. He's like, if I'm a mighty man, why are we so depressed? Why are we so discouraged? You know, why are we being so oppressed by these Midianites? It looks like the Lord has forsaken us. But this is what we read in Judges 6, starting in verse 14. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? So he said to him, O oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. And as you know, the Lord would use Gideon and how many? 
300 men to defeat how many Midianites? 135,000? Those are bad odds. It's like, what are you doing, Lord? Because the Lord is with him. That was the whole point. And as a result, Gideon once and for all discovered that whatever it is that God has called us to do, he will also enable us to, and empower us to do it. God constantly reminds us throughout his word, I will be with you. I am with you always. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And we need to hold on to those promises as well. So if the Lord is impressing something upon your heart and you can't get it out of your mind, then step out in faith and see what the Lord might do in and through your life. And if you're anything like me, you'll stumble and bumble around for a few years. Like, I don't know, Lord, is this really what you want me to do? When we started <clears throat> meeting as a home fellowship, we ended up getting 25 people coming to our home fellowship. And then I felt the Lord putting it on our heart because we were meeting on Friday nights in our home and it was getting too many people with the kids. So being a custodian at Pomona, I went to the principal there and said, hey, we're, we started a kind of a church thing here and we want to know if we can use uh, Pomona as a place to meet. And the principal said, you know how to clean up after yourself, Jeff. So he handed me the key. So God causes all things to work together for good. So the first week, six of us showed up. Second week, there were six of us. Third week, there were six of us. And I'm like, Lord, what's going on here? I thought you called me to do this. And he was showing me all along. Are you looking at the numbers? Or are you going to feed the people that I bring? Are you going to teach the word of God to those that come? I was like, okay, so I just kept going. It was like eight, and then pretty soon all everybody showed up. The very first family <clears throat> that showed up at Pomona Elementary School that wasn't part of our home fellowship were the adults. Mick and Chris, their three kids, Jeremy, their son, then Bethany, their daughter, and, the, <laughs> and then Melody. Almost, I spaced out her name a lot. I looked at Bethany. Who is that? Melody. Oh, that's right. You know Melody, Trevor plays a drum sometimes. I mean, they were the first ones to show up. I said, how did you guys even hear about it? Well, there's a sandwich board out there on Patterson and 25 and a half road. We saw that, thought, well, let's check it out. It's amazing what God can do. If you just step out in faith and say, here I am, Lord, use me, and you'll stumble and bumble around, but eventually you'll end up right where God wants you to be. So be encouraged by that. Don't think, well, I tried this and it didn't work out. So God must not want to use me. Be careful. Look at verse 12. We'll wrap it up here. This final section. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbath you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it, it shall surely be put to death. Whoever profanes it shall surely be put to death. For whoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people. That means to be put to death. Work shall be done six days, but the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Therefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath. Who? The children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and who? The children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And when he had made an end of speaking with him on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. So that's where you picture God and the lightning bolt coming out of his finger and Charlton Heston holding the two tablets and God writes the Ten Commandments on that with his finger. That's where it comes from. Be that as it may. Here God reaffirms what he told Moses back in chapter 20. He's quoting and expounding on the fourth commandment. You shall keep the Sabbath day. It is a holy day. You shall keep it holy. He goes on to say that nobody is to work on that day. After all, God created the entire universe in six days, but then he rested on the seventh day. What does Sabbath mean? Rest. God rested, not because he was tired. He's omnipotent. 
He just spoke everything into existence. How hard is that God for how hard is that for God to do? Just speak it out. Let there be light. There's light. Okay, let there be stars. There's stars. I mean, he wasn't working up a sweat. Wow, this is really getting tough. I don't know if I can do this. I need a break. No. God just put it all out there and then he rested. It simply means that when he finished, he finished. That's the word rest there means for him. I'm done. I, I've finished everything. I, I've created everything. And so he was able to just enjoy his creation. That day was set aside so that God's people could enjoy a time of rest and relaxation as they worshiped the Lord, as they fellowshiped with the Lord. In fact, when God created Adam and Eve, it was on what day? Friday. They were the last of God's creation. Friday afternoon. He creates Adam and Eve. So that means their first full day was the Sabbath. What a way to wake up the next morning. Oh, man, just in the presence of the Lord. We're just resting in the Lord, worshiping our Creator, getting to know the one who made them. It must have been awesome. And so Adam and Eve's first full day on earth was a Sabbath rest just to enjoy fellowship with their Creator. So from the very beginning, God was trying to communicate with His people Life is more than just making money. Life is more than just working hard. Life is more than being successful and having enough to play. God created us because He loves us, and He wants us to experience His love for us as we grow in our relationship with Him. God has always been more interested in us, not so we can be servants for God, but he wants to just be in fellowship with us. He didn't create you to serve him. He created you because he loves you and wants you to know him. Now, obviously, God knows our tendencies. Even as believers, you know, God will give you the green light on something and you go, wow, okay, God's put me into this and I'm going to go. And you can get so busy working for God that you lose sight of the fact that God is with you he loves you, and He wants you to look to Him and rest in Him, because the job can be sometimes more important in our minds than the fellowship, and He doesn't ever want us to get to that point. He doesn't want us getting so busy for Him that we lose sight of Him. Remember the church of Ephesus. It's in Revelation chapter 2. Twice Jesus says, I know your works. I know your labor. And it was, He was commending them because they're working hard. They're laboring hard. But then he says in Revelation 2, verse 4, Nevertheless, I have this against you. You have left your first love. That means that intimate relationship. That first love refers to a honeymoon type of a relationship that God had when he created us. And he wants us. When you're born again, when you're saved, man, I was just so excited to be in the Word, just spending time with Jesus, getting to know the one who saved me, the one who loved me, the one who created me. And I didn't care about anything else. You know, it was just awesome. And that's what God wants us to stay in that kind of relationship with, us, with Him so we continue to grow in that close personal relationship with Jesus. Another thing to take note of is, is this. God makes it very clear that the Sabbath is a sign between God and the children of Israel forever. As followers of Jesus, we know that Jesus fulfilled every aspect of the law perfectly, including the Sabbath. He is our Sabbath rest. Read Hebrews chapter 4. It's all about Jesus is our Sabbath rest. He fulfilled all the law, all Ten Commandments, every jot and tittle of the law, and so we find our rest not in worshiping on Saturday, we find our rest in Jesus, being with Him, worshiping Him every day. So if someone asks you, so when was the Sabbath day changed? The answer is it wasn't changed. It's still Saturday. It's still His covenant with the Jewish people. That's why they worship on Sabbath. Now, we don't need to observe Saturday. After all, where was Jesus on Saturday after the crucifixion? Dead, buried in the tomb. It wasn't until the first day of the week, Sunday morning, that's when He rose up from the dead, and that became the reason why so many in the church began to worship on Sunday because it's the day Jesus rose up. We don't worship a dead Jesus. We worship the risen living Jesus. Let me close with a few verses here. Look at this verse in Colossians chapter 2, starting in verse 16. 
It says, let no one judge you in regard to what? Notice, food or in drink. So if you're a Jewish person and now you're born again, let no one judge you if you say, you know what, I think I want to have a ham sandwich. A Jew would say, no way. But if you're saved, you're no longer under the law. So you can do that. Remember in Galatians chapter 2, Paul gets on Peter's case. They were very, very Jewish, but when they were in Galatia, planting these Gentile churches in Galatia, Peter comes up, and he's enjoying all the fellowship with the Gentile believers. He's eating pork rolls and ham sandwiches, and then these guys from Jerusalem show up, and they like, what are you doing, Peter? And he withdrew, it says, from the brethren. Paul gets on his case. Paul looks at him and says, you're a hypocrite, Peter. Read Galatians 2. It's awesome. Because here's Peter. Day of Pentecost. Preaches the gospel. 3,000 saved. A few years later, he's like, oh, man, I can't believe I did that. Because Paul says, you're a hypocrite. You are, you're a Jew. You're living like a Gentile, eating with the Gentiles. Now these Jews show up, and now you're telling these Gentiles they got to live like Jews? That's not right. And so he came down on them. He says, let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. The shadow, we don't follow the shadow, we follow the substance. We follow Jesus, the one who fulfilled all the law on our behalf. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. We don't boast in our works. Well, I keep the Sabbath. And there's a groups out there. That's their whole basis. Well, we know we're right with God because we worship on Saturday. I don't care what day you worship on. I'll close with this. This is the definitive work, the definitive answer that this is what it's all about. This is Romans chapter 14, verses 5 and 6. One person, Paul says, esteems one day above another. Saturday, that's the only day to worship God. Sunday, that's the day to worship God. No. Paul says one person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. In other words, seven days a week. Those are all good days to worship the Lord. Jesus is risen. He's living in your heart. He's dwelling with you. Every day is a day to worship God. Not just one day a week, but if you want to worship Saturday, fine. But don't put that on everybody. If you want to worship Sunday, great, but don't think that's the only day you can worship the Lord. Every day is a great day to worship the Lord. One esteems one day above another, another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day, observes it to the Lord. So if you want to worship on Saturday, hey, your focus has to be on the Lord. And he who does not observe the day, not Saturday, to the Lord, he does not observe it. Again, you're still focusing on the Lord. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks. And he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat and give, gives God thanks. Now, I love to use Larry Dubin as an illustration of this, and he doesn't mind me saying this because um, he's a good friend of ours. He's, he was with Jews for Jesus for 20 years. He and his wife are both, you know, Jewish, raised in Orthodox Jewish homes, his wife, Debbie, you know, as Jewish as you can be. They both get saved. They get married. They've been working in Jewish ministries for years and years. Debbie will eat anything. I mean, anything. Crawfish, lobster, shrimp. That's unclean. Well, if you're um, in the law, yeah, it is. Larry won't eat certain things because he goes, I know I'm free to eat pork chops, but I just can't. His wife's like, okay, I'll eat it. Pass it over. You know? It's okay. One feels free to do it, the other feels not. It doesn't matter. As long as you're doing whatever you're doing is unto the Lord. So, praise the Lord, you're here on a Sunday morning, but if we're meeting on Saturday, praise the Lord. I encourage you, when you wake up tomorrow, give God thanks for the day. Set it aside for the Lord. Let Him work in you and through you. Let your light so shine before men that they might see your good works. Wherever you're working, whatever you're doing, and then give all the glory to the Lord.